Today we are still in the book of 1 Peter. Uh, today we are going to pick it up in 1 Peter chapter 3. Uh, we're looking, today we'll be looking at verses, maybe verses 13 through 17 will be what we hopefully can get through. Um, before we jump into that though, I like to every week just kind of recap what was talked about because the context uh, so often as we walk through a book or a letter, uh, the context is what's, what's critical uh, because it keeps everything framed. Um, so what have we been talking about the last handful of weeks? Submission to authority. Okay, submission to authority, okay. What other kind of uh, ideas and concepts have we seen within that? also seen the idea of what looks like in suffering okay as we've submitted to authority and we've walked through uh, pretty much again I'm gonna keep saying this since chapter 2 verse 13 uh, Peter's really been talking about what it looks like to submit to authority um, and what it looks like to suffer um, and a big part of what he walks through and he talks about is for us guys in our life that it's hard for us to uh, you know we have to humble ourselves we have to not be proud or prideful um, we have to put other people before ourselves. Um, and that's really what it looks like to be able to submit to authority. And, and he talks about a lot of what he talks about suffering. Um, that there's a suffering that even comes in, in, in that when you do submit to authority and submit to uh, leadership. Um, sometimes it, it comes in the form of suffering. Like, you know, and, and for us, that suffering a lot of times like, woe is me. Uh, you know, but it can even be worse than that. Um, but a big part of how it applies to us is, you know, we might go through something where we feel like it's unfair. Uh, woe is me. Uh, this is so unfair to me. Um, and what Peter talks about a lot here, guys, is the idea of like whatever's going on with us, that we're supposed to be focused on the gospel. We're supposed to be focused on the gospel and the idea of trying to help people come to know who Jesus is. To be able to live a life that people would inquire, who is this God that you serve? Um, a lot of, we looked at last week the Old Testament how Peter quotes and he p brings out this scripture from Psalms and how God's heart in the Old Testament I shared last week is his heart in the Old Testament was that people would uh, live a life that displayed the Ten Commandments he's in covenant with the people in the Old Testament his goal his instruction for the people was that hey you live a life that people would say who is this God that you serve did you hear me my king my priest a holy nation um, Exodus 19 5 and 6 and the same thing is true in the New Testament. He's redeemed us and through Christ Jesus. We've been set free from a life of slavery to sin. Um, and we have a relationship with God. We have eternal life in heaven. And we look at him and we should look at him and say, Man, you know, Jesus, you've done all this for me. What is it that you want from me? And it's the same thing. Jesus would say, I want you to live in a way that people would ask, Who is this God that you serve? Um, and, and Peter spends so much time, uh, Peter spends so much time talking about all this because it's such a big deal. Um, it's This is something that's hard for people. It was hard for the people back and uh, when Peter wrote this letter, it was hard for them to be willing to submit to authority and suffer and suffer for righteousness. Um, and it's hard for us to do that today to have the right mindset. Um, and if when you read this, if you can really just process through, guys, there's a lot of application each week. There's a lot of application for us where we find ourselves. Uh, every day we feel like we're treated unjustly in some way or another, whether it's somebody like your spouse, uh, a friend, uh, somebody driving on the highway, somebody at Walmart. I mean, there's all kinds of times throughout the day when we feel like we're treated unjustly. I mean, be honest, like how many times has something happened to you where uh, all of a sudden you just get filled with anger or rage or, you know, somebody just is rude to you at Walmart and you walk off and be like, what a, you know, blankety, I can't believe he treated me like that. I mean, you know, the nerve of that guy. Um, but and Peter, his whole thought, guys, is he as he progresses through this letter, is that we would in those instances that we be mindful of the gospel. Okay, and as we and it's important that you get that context of everything he's been talking about, how he's been hammering it, 
and that you don't miss that he said, hey, Christ, this great example that we have, that we're supposed to submit and follow his great example. He says in uh, chapter 2, verses 21 to 25, this great example of this guy who, when he was being crucified, when he was hung on the cross, that he could have said, oh, you wait, the hammer's coming. I mean, God's going to smack you down for what you did. He could have said any number of things, and instead he prays and says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Okay, so keep all that in mind, because when we read this right here, Peter's going to guess what he's going to do. He's going to drive this point home even further for us today as we look at these next couple of verses. So 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 through 17, it says, Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to anyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you were slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better if God should will it that you suffer for doing what is right rather than doing what is wrong. I want to focus on those verses today and start kind of walking through them. First Peter chapter three. Excuse me. No, you're good. First Peter chapter three, verse thirteen. So, as we, I, I want to throw to you guys just in these verses we read. It's kind of like a lot of words, a lot of stuffs going on. Um, but do you do you sense or do you get the idea of anything that he's talking about? What, what, what's something that's kind of in these verses? What's he talking about? Oh, for me, it's uh, if you got God on your side, there's nobody, nothing can do anything. Okay. All um, right. No matter what they do to you, at the end of this, this is it's still great. Okay. Right. That's good. Anything else that we see in these verses? Anything else, kind of just like overall, like an like an overall kind of theme, uh, per se, that we might see in verses thirteen to seventeen. Right. Okay, and, and that's and th- those are like parallel, y'all. The answer is almost exactly the same. Um, just to, and it's a hundred percent, y'all are right on. But just to back it up just a little bit, we see the idea in these verses. He would say nothing can come against you. Nothing's gonna be able to harm you for doing right when you're because there's gonna be suffering. So the the biggest idea that's here is that there's gonna be hey guys, there's gonna be this idea of suffering. There's going to be this little this idea of suffering. So and, and so this is just I just want to show you this is a continuation of that same type of thought for him of whatever's going on with us, whatever where we might find us, find ourselves. So um, uh, he's been talking about it and he's still talking about this idea. Um, so for me, guys, if I'm not if I was at home and I'm doing Bible study and I'm reading through these verses and I've been reading this same thing since chapter two, verse thirteen, and just this big I feel like it's just a big continuation of thought. Suffering for doing right, righteous, submitting to other people, a fallen example of Christ. Guys, like this really would be something that you, as you read this, you would want to be like making some note. Like, hey, he's not spending two chapters, the better part of two chapters, writing all this stuff so I can just gloss over it. He's spending all this time writing all this because this is a very big problem that uh, Christians face to really be able to see what it looks like to be able to submit to authority, to be able to suffer, to be able to suffer for doing right, to be able to uh, be mindful of the gospel. Um, so anyway, uh, verse 13 says, Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? <clears throat> so just want to take it a verse at a time and just kind of walk through these. Verse 13, what are some things that we see there and what kind of stands out? The, the uh, Life Application Bible says if you are eager to do good. Okay. So just words a little different. Yeah. Uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of a weird question. It, it's got a question mark. It's kind of strange. Now you will want. Now who will want to harm you if you are eager to do, to do good? But what's strange is we're in a world that does ridicule you mm-hmm. for doing good. Yeah. That does ostracize you mm-hmm. for standing up for Christ. Yeah. So, so a couple things there, and, and right, you're right on point. Uh, so when he's writing this, this is a rhetorical question, and that's why it kind of stands out a little bit, uh, kind of, kind of a little bit weird there. 
Um, but it's a rhetorical question. Who would harm you for wanting to do good? So first of all, as he writes and asks this question, is he talking about just general good, like for, uh, like I'm going to be mindful of my actions overall? Um, let me say this. He's talking about uh, being mindful of your actions overall. Um, to where, like, as he talks about, as he talk about in a minute about having a clean conscience before God. It's right. not necessarily the idea of walking around and I'm going to just be preaching the gospel and be all about the gospel. It's saying in my life, I'm going to live a righteousness and a holiness that he's called me to live. And so what Peter's saying is like, overall, who's going to be out to harm you if you're just trying to live a good life? Overall, who's going to do that? Most of the time, no one's going to want to harm you. But he goes on to say that people are going to want to harm you because the reason that you're doing it is because of Christ Jesus. The reason I want to have a clear conscience before God and live this righteous life that he's called me to live is because I'm trying to be mindful of the gospel. And so if I'm going to live a, a life for the gospel, eventually persecution is going to come against me. Eventually I am going to have to have some suffering in my life. Um, but as he talks about here, it's just a general question. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous or prove eager, as, as Carter saying his translation says, uh, to want to do good? Um, so anyway, well, just it, thoughts there. He kind of takes my mind, fast forward to 16, where he says, but you must do this in a gentle and respectful way. So he's kind of answering it for me where, you know, it's living a good life. It's like you said, it's not just one one particular act. It's how you respond to people, I guess, mm -hmm. how you show love to people, how mm -hmm. you show compassion and uh, patience to people. Mm -hmm. All in all, how you respond and treat people if you're doing good, then it talks about having your, your conscience clear. Mm -hmm. And that's how we can have our conscience clear. Because we right. know that there's no there's no interior motive mm -hmm. inside us for that's what right. we're doing good for somebody. Yeah. Right on. Right. That's how really we, good. How we respond to people about Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. so. Amen. That's good. Um, <clears throat> anything else kind of stand up in that verse? Well, in the study guide, in my study Bible, it uh, references doing what is good will harm no one, though believers may suffer for it, in which case they should count it a privilege to suffer for a lifestyle that pleases God. Amen. Mm -hmm. And as we go, as we walk through the rest of those verses, we'll see that highlighted uh, really well. Um, Amen. What was that? About. I need to write that down. Where was that? Uh, we're in First Peter chapter three, verses thirteen to seventeen is where we're at right now. Um, one thing that I just want to highlight before we move on to the next verse is that uh, Peter, as he writes, he says, "Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good?" Um, as he asks this rhetorical question, something that we should key in on, guys, is that we're called to live a zealous life for what is good. That's the that's the that's part of the call that's on us. As he would say, who 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 would who would who would want to harm me for doing what you're supposed to be doing? And to be zealous is is the idea of being eager. I mean, that's a great word to, to go with it. Zealous is a little bit like a maybe in, in our minds maybe a little bit grander uh, type thought to be zealous or to have zeal. Uh, but it's to be uh, to to live this life where um, you're you are eager. Um, but it's that you want to pursue it and not stop. You want to run after it. You're, you're. I mean, to be zealous is, to, you know, to be filled with zeal. I mean, it's a, right. it's a more robust word, and it's, it's that I'm going to pursue it. And I'm not going to stop. I'm um, emphatic about wanting to have this. You know why I like eager? Because eager is a word for consciousness. When you're eager about something, like if you're eager to go to the Cowboys game later today, you're thinking about it. Yeah. So as you walk through life, every moment between now and getting to that cowboy game, it's in your mind. No, that's you're really eager to go. You're yeah. conscious of. You're conscious of it. So yeah. if we're conscious of how we treat people, if we're conscious of the calling on our life, if we're eager to fulfill it, then every moment by moment, it's going to be in the forefront of our yeah. mind. We're continually eager, we're eager, eager, eager. Yeah. So that's why I kind of like that word even yeah. because it, it's like when you're eager about something, you're conscious of it. You're yeah. thinking about. That's good. That's a good way to be able to break it down. That's good. Um, uh, any other thoughts there before we move on to the next verse and kind of follow his flow of thought here? All right, so verse 14 says, But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed, and do not fear their intimidation, and do not be troubled 
and do not be troubled. Um, so some, some thoughts we see there in verse 14. But even if you suffer right for doing right, so there's going to be times when you suffer, and there's going to be mm-hmm. times when you don't. Mm-hmm. That's right. But even if you do suffer, so he's he's just telling us to expect it, right? So, mm-hmm. but even if you do suffer, I mean, it's we we, we know that we're going to suffer because people are going to be offended by the truth. Mm-hmm. That's right, a hundred percent. So uh, again. Keep in mind, at this point right now, as he's talking about things that are good, he's just talking about just living the moral life that we're, we're called to live, the life of righteousness. And he's going to expound on that in just a minute. It's going it's gonna, to it's gonna open up more. Um, but right now, it's just this idea of like you're living this life that's good, this good life. Um, but even if you do suffer for the sake, like what Curtis is saying, he goes on for the sake of righteousness, okay? So the reason is because you're trying to live this righteous life, this right life that, that God, that's righteousness. As you say this right life that God's called us to live. Um, you're blessed. What does that mean? God's protection is on you. Amen. God, he, God um, backs you. If he be for me, whom can be against me? That's right. That's good. Yeah, and just to, to define that and give the and, and to maybe put feet to that where we can kind of have it, give it something where we can really walk with. You ever gone through, uh, and maybe, maybe some of you guys have, and uh, maybe you haven't, um, but have you ever had a time in your life when you know that you're doing something that's right? You know that you're trying to honor the Lord, and it feels like everyone's against you. It feels like everything is against you. In those times when you're really seeking to honor the Lord and, and do what you're supposed to do, and the enemy's attacking, and it feels like everyone's attacking you, um, in those times when you're really seeking the Lord and you're seeking His face, you're blessed because you have this intimate and close relationship with Him in that moment where even though somebody around you would look and say, uh, man, uh, I would be falling apart right now. And, and you can sit there and say, I mean, I have this closeness with the Lord right now that I can't explain. I normally would fall apart. And so as we're focused on Him in those moments, and that's what He's saying, even if you do suffer, if you're focused on Him and you're seeking to build that relationship, those are moments where you're blessed because you have this close and intimate fellowship with Him. And and everyone else might not understand it, but you can sit there and you say, man, this is like... It's like he's sitting with me, right? It's like we're we're here, and 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 we have this close relationship. He says in verse twelve, right before all this, he says, "For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears attend to their prayers." This very thought that he just had kind of even illustrates and kind of shows what he what he's talking about. It looks like to be blessed. It's not this future blessing necessarily that he's talking about. Like, oh, eventually you'll have a blessing. He's talking about right now in the middle of suffering, guys that we can have a blessing in our relationship with the Lord Jesus. I just want to throw this out there, and this is just this is a rhetorical question, not for y'all to answer, but how many times are we going through a rough time and a rough situation where we're able to sit there and say, I feel blessed right now because of my relationship with the Lord right now. Because most of the time, guys, I feel like what happens is, and I know this is my case, is I can get super caught up in what's going on in my life and my situation and say, woe is me, this is, this is so hard and this is so unfair. And I'm missing out on this opportunity for blessing in my life because my focus isn't on the gospel. My focus isn't on Christ the King. My focus is on me. And right here he says, hey, when we're focused on doing what's good for the sake of righteousness, which should always be our eager, we should look at with eagerness to do this, to live this type of life, then we're focused on the King. And in that moment, we're blessed. Man, that's, that's a pretty and I'll, incredible. I'll, I'll add that blessing. Here, what it looks like is peace in our heart. Amen. Peace in the storm. Peace. Amen. We 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 feel like what you were describing. I've been there too, where you just feel the spiritual warfare going on. Amen. You feel like everyone's against you, right? Um, and you you feel like your enemies hate you, and you feel like the, your loved ones 
um, are are separating themselves from you, mm-hmm. right? Like like you're like you're offending. You're even offending them because you're trying to follow your heart. Mm-hmm. And but in the middle of that, you feel sadness in your soul, but then you feel a peace. You you hear it that Amen. still quiet voice say, "I'm with you." Amen. Amen. I'm with you. Amen. And, and even like as you're describing it, like what I'm sensing for me is like it's hard to put in words what all that feels like when you're when you're in the middle of that. Right. It's just you have to just do what he's called you to do and have your focus where you're supposed to have your focus, and then you're you you're able to experience this type of relationship that often we don't get to because he sends us in suffering and allows us to be in suffering uh, for that very purpose. So. Um. Anyways, just some really good thoughts there, guys. And, and I just don't want you to miss that. I mean, he says you can be blessed. Um, it's a blessing for, for us. And when we're reading through, if you're, you know, again, if you're doing this Bible study at your house or you're reading some verses at your house and you read past and he says, hey, you know, uh, but even if you do suffer the sick righteousness, you're blessed. I mean, those are, you know, when you're reading, you, you don't want to just read over. You want to say, why, why is he saying this? What does this mean? How, how, am, I, how am I blessed? You know, what is he, what is he saying? Uh, and so that's what you want to you want to you know do what we're, we're doing right now just kind of dig in and ask those questions. What does that mean? Uh, because if we want to grow in our relationship with the Lord, if we want to grow into what He's called us to walk in, we can take what Peter says right here. This is what the Christian life looks like. I've spent two chapters telling you that this that's is right. what you're called to. You're called to suffer, that's right. like every one of us. We're called to suffer. Yeah. And when we walk out, and every time we walk out and we say, woe is me, we fail the suffering. I mean, that's the long and the short of what he's saying. Every time we say, oh, I can't believe how fair, oh, woe oh, is me, oh, Lord, oh, why, Lord, oh, you know. All these things, we're failing at suffering. We're failing at it. And that's why he says over and over and over and over and over and over and over, follow the example of Christ. This is what it's like to suffer. This is what it looks like. Even if, even if it's as bad as it could possibly be, there's still blessing. I mean, he's covering the whole gamut of everything that it'll look like to suffer as he walks through every one of these things. And it's just it's mind-blowing. And he, he's going to keep going. Go ahead. <laughs> so he's telling me that we're always going to suffer in something in this life. Okay, yeah. there's always going to be something new coming in our life that's going to cause us uh, some kind of pain because it's part of the growth process. Amen. It's part of the reality of living this wonderful life he gives us. However, how we respond, that's why we're sitting here reading this right now. That's why he recorded it in the book Amen. because we will <coughs> suffer. The reality is, is when we ask Jesus in our heart and become our Lord and Savior, we signed up for suffering because we're in a world who hates Jesus Christ. Amen. And because of that, so we must learn. This is a test. Some of us have more, more tests than others. Some of us go from one suffering situation to the next suffering situation, and God the Father would say right now to you, I want you to respond. I'm waiting for you to learn from this test. Amen. You're going to keep taking the test until you pass the test. Amen. You're going to keep taking this test. I'm going to deliberately make you take this test until you pass it. Mm-hmm. That's right. And when you learn how to pass it and walk in peace, no matter what's going on in your life, and trust in me with everything, mm-hmm. then you will see me step in. And the peace that surpasses all understanding will lift you up like an eagle, and you will soar above the problems. Amen. Life will still bring you problems, but you'll learn to take it catch that draft, you'll learn that peace and you'll learn to soar above the problems and as you become wiser and wiser in me you'll be able to handle more small problems, things that you'll look back that used to really bog you down will no longer bog you down because you've grown in me and and, and as you're saying all that, immediately the Lord, I feel like, brings to my mind Joseph in the Old Testament and the fact that he sits in prison for all those years and still is able to seek the Lord, is still able to praise the Lord. Just because we go through suffering uh, and have suffering in our life doesn't mean that all of a sudden that uh, once I respond correctly one time, all the suffering is gone. Right. Joseph is is sold into slavery, has all these things happen to him. He seeks the face of, of God the entire time, right. and even in the midst of prison and being in this, in this dungeon, still seeks the Lord and still is able to seek His face and honor him. He doesn't sit there. We don't read an account in the in the book of Genesis as we recap Joseph's life saying, woe is me. I can't believe I'm in prison. I can't believe all this is happening to me. He says, oh, you got a dream? Let me tell you what that dream means. This is what God said. 
Well, you know why? It's because Joseph knew that God would deliver him. Amen. God, Joseph had seen God deliver him Amen. from other things in his life previously, Amen. looking in the rear view of his, mirror of his life. Amen. The reason why Joseph had that peace is because Joseph had that confidence and knew that his Lord and Savior, if he was in the test, it was for a purpose. That's his right. Lord and Savior's in control. That's right. That's right. And it says today, though, and, and today, today in us, if That's we're right. suffering, it's for a purpose. That's right. Because he wants us to, he, like, bottom line is, is, is we get through in this next couple of verses, is that he says we're in suffering so that we have an opportunity to tell people about Jesus, Amen. about the King of Kings, about the salvation that's in him alone. That's the purpose. Anything that we're going through in our life is to be able to point back to him. And that's exactly, exactly what he's fixing to say to us. Don't lose the focus. I've gotten to a point now where I'm Through you, Cindy, but also through other people. I mean, that burden's not solely on you. Um, Some, I, I, sometimes I feel like it is because it, it's much. My, my child is going through it, and what do I do to make her feel like this is her only option? You just can't. You can't put all that on yourself, Cindy. You can't. She, that's choices that she's made but, in her life. You know, I, I know, and but you saw it. but that's still you can't you can't put all that on yourself. But that wasn't you, Cindy. Yeah. That was the enemy in control of your life. It's a spiritual war. You're interceding for your daughter right now. You got a gift, and I'm trying to think the give to me, Lord. But you got a gift. Sometimes some people have gifts where they can, where they where they earnestly pray for people. Because they, they they feel hurt that someone's living through and going through, and you've got that gift. I believe every mother has that for their children. I, I honestly do. But what you got is you need to listen to Danny. I mean, really, you need to put the emotion behind you. Because if you trust God, you got to put the emotion behind it. That old Cindy was not you. That was Satan in control of your life. That was the enemy in control of your life. It's a spiritual war. But I wreck people's lives. Did Jesus forgive you? Do you believe it? That he would say, stop holding it against yourself. <laughs> he said, release Lord. yourself, forgive yourself, because he's forgiven you. And trust in him to take care of your daughter. Trust in him that just as he took care of you and delivered you from it, mm -hmm. from the fiery pits of hell, he will deliver her as well. Mm -hmm. You can't do it. All you're doing is bogging yourself down, and now you're holding yourself guilty, and that's the enemy telling you that it's your fault. Right. You need to rebuke him in the name of Jesus Christ. You need to take authority over him because you have authority until Jesus get under your feet. I am a new creature in Jesus Christ. By the blood of Jesus, I am bought by the blood. All things are new. He's a liar, Cindy. He's a liar and he's attacking you, girl. That's right. I fully agree with that. 100%. 100%. So rebuke him in the name of Jesus. I mean, every 10 seconds if you need to, then he will flee and your peace will come back. You have the authority. Don't give it to him. That's right. You're keeping you under attack. It's keeping you from being able to help her. That's right. It's enabling you from doing anything. He, he's keeping, he's trying to keep you away because he knows that you're, God's on your side. So he's attacking you. So that God's I, I do be. feel like I have to stay away from her because I get emotional and she doesn't listen. And, right. And, but all this week, the <laughs> only, uh, only thing that I've been able to do for her, not talk to her or anything, but I've just been praying for her and I send her little scriptures and texts. She never responds, but... I know she's getting them, so. Yeah. I mean, that's what you can do. Yeah. Yes. 
That's all you can do. That's right. And that's what you need to keep doing. And just keep keep praying for her. If the Lord brings you to her mind and brings her to your mind, then you pray for her. Just, just be praying for her. Just be in continual prayer for her. Um, and the Lord, as, as, as we seek to be righteousness, for the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and he hear and his ears attend to their prayers. As we seek to live the life that he's called us to live, his eyes are toward the righteous, and his ears attend to their prayers. And this is what you got to trust in. you got to believe in, Lord. You know? and, and it's not that, you know, hey, I'll pray in a day later. I mean, look at Joseph again. Years in, in the dungeon. Uh, you know, sometimes it takes time. You know, we have to work out consequences. Consequences have to work themselves out. I mean, but we, in like you right now, you're called to be just praying for her. If you're grieving in your heart, that's the opportunity for you to pray. And like Curtis said, you need to rebuke and cast Jesus. down the enemy and say, he's you know, wait, he's get away from that. And he's that's attacking right. you when you do that. That's right. he, like she said, he's there and he's ready to pounce on you. Right. As it, soon as you start. And he knows, he knows how to push your buttons. That's right. That's right. You, it's a shame this. It's, it's just a You see more room? Mm-hmm. Go watch it again. I'll watch it again. Because this week. you miss it. it <laughs> because everyone should have grabbed, grabbed something from that. I'm yeah. serious. I, I watched it this good. week. Yes. Did you? I mean, this, come on. That is a fundamental principle that I believe God wanted us to learn from that movie. That's why He allowed it. Amen. That should wrap up our life, guys. Every, every one of us should have a war room. That is the reality that we live in. Our battle is fought spiritually. You need to go before God, before the throne, interceding for your kids every day, rebuking the devil from you and rebuking the devil from them kids. It's a fight, Cindy, and you've got to get in the fight. Right now you're getting beat up because you don't understand the authority that you have. You need to get in the fight. Amen. All of us do. Amen. 100%. Amen. I agree wholeheartedly. Amen. That's how we. That's how we fight these battles. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> that's how we fight Amen. battles. Amen. That's right. Um, just kind of walking, continuing to walk through though, and just this heart that he has that he's saying, "Hey, even if we do suffer for their sake of righteousness, we are blessed because of that opportunity we have for that relationship and that depth of that relationship, guys." And uh, I just would encourage you right now. I just want to just in my heart, just want to encourage you guys, like guys, it's going to come. It, it might not be here today, but it's going to come. You're going to face something so tremendous in your life that you're going to feel like there's no way out of this. And in that moment, guys, God, I just pray that you'd help us to all be mindful. Of, even me, just, just really help us to be mindful in that moment that he's giving you a chance to be able to turn to him and build that relationship and be blessed as we seek him. Um, man, so I just want to tell you that. Amen. And he says with these people, when they come against you, whatever it is, he says, and do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. Um, in there he quotes, maybe your Bible, I just want to highlight this, maybe your Bible has it uh, where it's in small caps, has a little reference number or something, but he is quoting from the book of Isaiah there um, and just carrying over some thought there. Uh, but he, he gives a warning not to fear these people who are faithless, who don't understand, who, don't, who aren't Christians, who, who uh, uh, might be hostile towards you. Don't uh, fear them. Don't be concerned about how they might intimidate you, he says. Um, and do not be troubled. Um, and this idea of being troubled, guys, is the idea of being emotional. Don't let them attack your emotions. And Cindy, for you, I mean, really, this, this applies to the enemy's attack on you just as much. And he's, he's saying, don't be intimidated by them and don't let them shake up your emotions. Don't let them trouble you. In the middle of a hard time, guys, in hardship and suffering, if we're really going to live out a life where we're willing to lay down ourselves, it's going to suck sometimes. It's going to be hard. And whatever's going on, we, he's, tell, he's trying to tell us, don't get caught up in all this other thought. You have to stay focused on the Lord. Amen. So, um, walking into verse 15, he says, But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. So what's some things that we see there as he okay. kind of brings all this together? I, well, I'm going I'm to I'm take 15 and say it's, it can be a few. He's, he's saying a few things I believe in my heart. Yeah. But I'm going to talk about the latter thing that's not so apparent. He says in the new, in this, te- this, uh, this version says instead, 
you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. So when things come against you, you sh we should be eager and conscious to do good. And when we're suffered, when someone speaks evil against us because we're walking in truth, and we suffer because of it. Maybe we suffer by them saying things that hurt our feelings. Maybe we suffer by them withdrawing their relationship from us, right? He says when, when this pain, when the suffering comes upon us, he's saying, turn to me. Truck. Worship Jesus. Truck. Our strength comes from putting our mind back on Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. In the midst of the suffering, in the midst of the pain, we literally take our consciousness and put it back on Jesus Christ right. and worship Jesus Christ. That's right. And that's where the peace, because as long as our eyes are on the Lord, we're not seeing all this. That's right. And that's absolutely one of the single most hardest things to do when you're in the middle of a hard time. I mean, it really is. Um, but that's exactly spot on. Uh, and Curtis's translation is really good. Mine says, but sanctify Christ as Lord. I know some other translations say, uh, reverence the Lord, uh, reverence Christ as Lord. Uh, but it, it, his translation is spot on. And what it means is this idea of, that we're supposed to, in our hearts, set him up and, and, and realize his position. When it says sanctify him, it says set him apart as holy. Realize who he is. Realize his position. And, and let that be our focus. Exactly, man. Spot on what Curtis is saying. And that's what we're supposed to do in a heart in hardship, guys. When things are hard, when things are difficult, we're supposed to be able to turn our eyes and say, "Okay, I know all this other crap's going on," uh, and I just felt like I'm supposed to tell y'all, man. Like this morning, I told Cherish, I told her, I said, "I just felt like throwing in the towel." I, I do. That's what I told her this morning. I'm just tired of everything. I'm tired of work. I'm tired of even going to church. I just don't want to do it. I feel I feel just beat down. I don't even really want to keep doing life anymore. That's how I told her. And, and this morning, this like 100% application of, yeah, my focus is in the complete wrong place because I, I can look at stuff at work. I can look at stuff in my life. I can look at all these things that are bothering me. Come on. But they're not what I'm supposed to be focused on. That's right. I'm supposed to focus on the gospel. I'm supposed to focus on the kingdom. And when I get distracted by all this other stuff, yeah, I, I do want to throw in the towel. Like, y'all don't, I can only share like a little bit how I feel, but I mean, like when I said that this morning, I meant that with everything that I was within me, I feel it done. Because I'm looking at all this stuff around me. Um, and 100% right here, Peter says, hey, and Danny, your focus is in the complete wrong place. Right. Um, in that moment, Danny, I, and I've been in that moment a lot, actually. And so I, he's taught me that, again, that's why I like this version. I used to be a King James guy. Oh, man, man I'm just saying, guys. But <laughs> instead, you must we worship know. Christ. You must worship Christ. Amen. You must worship Christ as Lord of your life. Worship means to, what does worship mean to you? Worship means sing praises to him. Worship means get on your knees and tell him how good and holy he is and how lowly you are. Mm -hmm. Worship means to put everything mm -hmm. you got in you into worshiping, serving him, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I can't tell you how often just when I feel like that, when he puts me somewhere quiet and I worship him, pray to him and worship him, sings to him, worship him. That's the key. Amen. That's what changes our mind. That's what gives up. We're, when we go from feeling like we don't want anything in this life, we're tired of it, ready, ready to throw the towel in, he reinvigorates us because our focus is on worshiping our God. And when we pour out praises unto him, he, it flows. He fills our cup. Amen. The Bible talks about how overfill fill my cup, Lord, overflowing. Mm -hmm. That joy and peace unspeakable Jesus talks about. He fills our cup. Amen. And the whole idea is he's, he's smarter than us. He knows that that cup's going to run empty really quick. It becomes a state that it's something that we should do day by day by day. We should go to our Father and we should worship Him so He can fill us up. Amen. Amen. That's good. Um, any other thoughts? Any other parts of that verse stand out? Um, always 
uh, see, but sanctify or make us, uh, but reverence Christ as the Lord, worship Christ as the Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that's in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Anything else stand out to you guys there? I think when you can focus yourself towards God instead of focusing on your problems, the more you do that, the easier it is. I'm not saying it's always easy, yeah. but it becomes more of a habit, and it's easier to redirect your mind back to that than yeah. if you live all about your and struggle all yeah. the time. Yeah. And the woe is me. If, if you can do it once, and you do it again, and you make habit of it, then when you are in a really bad place, it's easier for, say, your spouse to come and say, hey, redirect yourself, and you're like, oh yeah, this is what I need to do. Amen. That's good. That's a good point. Really good. Um, one thing that I just want to kind of highlight there, guys, is that he writes in here and he says, uh, make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that's in you. This is where he kind of brings everything together. Remember I said he was talking about living a good life and and having this focus of being kind of righteous. And it wasn't really about necessarily this idea of like just living the gospel. It was more this idea of just like I'm going to live a moral life that he's called me to live. I'm going to live a life of righteousness that he's called me to live. But guys, when we live the life that he's called us to live, it's supposed to be so radically different from everybody else that they notice and that they know there's a reason that you're doing it. He says, when it, make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account of the hope that's within you. This is where he brings it all together, the reason that we're doing it. And guys, when we're doing it, we're supposed to be living such a radically different life than everyone that whenever they see us, that they would want to ask, why are you doing what you're doing? It doesn't make sense to me is one of the clearest places in the Scripture where it tells us that our life is supposed to be so radically different from our good works and our righteous life that people would ask you and question you and you should be able to give a defense for the reason that you're doing it, for the hope that's within you. I just want to ask and just throw, the, again, a rhetorical question, but when's the last time somebody came up to you and said, what you're doing doesn't make sense to me. The life that you're living, the choices you're making, the morality that you're living by, the righteousness that you're choosing, it doesn't make sense to me. Why would you do what you're doing? Because that's the life we're supposed to live. And guys, we all fall short and we all mess up at times. But like right now, the Holy Spirit maybe brings something instance to you, to mind, um, and understand He gives you an opportunity to be able to do that tomorrow, to, to do that today, to do that later today. Um, so uh, I just don't want you to miss that right there. That is a, a key verse to everything he's talking about, this life that we live, um, where we're not always walking around necessarily <coughs> preaching about the gospel so everybody knows that we're being about Jesus, but we're living a life that people know that it's about Jesus. Powerful. Um, I don't know if everybody else gets this. I, I seem to get it a lot lately, but and I can't stand the phrase, but it it always comes to comes to me from other people. Why are you acting so holier than thou? I don't see. I don't see that. Yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't understand. I'm not holier than anything. When you try and live in the light as he's in the light, as we're called to, and other people are in darkness, the dark, the, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness that flees they, from they, it. Well, that's that one reason. They, yeah, they, I mean, they, they, yeah. Yeah. they, they that, see. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, brother. You're right. I agree with you, because you're right, but some people are hurting. If you're talking about, that's what he's been talking about in the scripture. Some people that do that that are in the church... <laughs> here it's because they're hurting mm -hmm. they're judging you from their hurt they become jealous it all stems from their heart not being the right place with God 
because we should all be living out of an earnest, sincere, humble heart before our God and Creator. We shouldn't become jealous of any of our brothers and sisters in the church. We should Not if our hearts are out with Christ. We should be happy for somebody when someone succeeds in something. And we see that someone's broken a strong, God's broken a stronghold in somebody's life. Mm-hmm. But sometimes people that are in the church, especially if you've opened up to them, they know the sin that used to be in your life. And they become jealous. The devils in their head speak, putting little little seeds, putting little thoughts in their head, and they don't even realize it. I, I knew you when you used to this. Exactly. I know there's you one when you used There's to one that. example. That's right. That's one example where you're asking the question, why do people do that? That's one way. Another way is if they're out in the world and they don't know Christ whatsoever. But, you know, then when you're going back to what you're, this right here, the the Lord was speaking to me. And by the way, you keep saying, Curtis said, Curtis said, that's making me very uncomfortable. I wish you would quit that because I ain't saying nothing. My prayer, I don't say anything unless God puts it on my heart because I'm accountable for every idle word before him. I will be. I'll start saying so, the words that came out of Curtis. I feel like he's put on my heart anyway that he's talking about our testimony right there. Mm-hmm. Going back to these Amen. verses here. Amen. We 100%. need to be ready. A lot of people, everybody's watching us. A lot of people aren't going to come out and say, you know what, and give you that compliment. I can tell you're a holy man, Jason, because the way you live. I agree. Wow, you're holy. You're awesome, man. Right. People who even think that, they're not going to say it. Right. Because they don't want to give you any glory because the devil inside of them doesn't want to give any glorification, gratification to God, for one. There's a lot of reasons why they won't say anything, but that don't mean they're not watching. Right. People are watching us, guys. Some in the church, people are watching us. You're watching me. If my heart ain't right, I could be watching you. Out in the world, our family, they're watching us. For sure. But we need to be ready to he's talking about being ready to give a testimony. And here's the other thing he's telling me why we need to we need to know our testimony, guys. Amen. What what is Amen. our reason for our hope? Amen. We need to know what our testimony why is it that we do continue to serve Jesus Christ? instead of just serving our own flesh in the world. Mm-hmm. What is it he saved us from? Right? The other reason why we need to know our testimony and be ready, have this built up, be ready to give this defense, this defense which is our testimony, it builds up our own faith. It edifies us. The more we say it, the more we believe it. Amen. And the more strength comes in our life and power and authority in our life through Christ Jesus because we rehearsed it. Amen. It's like being a movie actor. You don't just get on stage or get in, you know, on a set and start just spilling it, fitting out the words. You rehearse it over and over and over and over and over until you become that person. Amen. Amen. That's really good. That's, that's powerful. That's super powerful. Uh, the words that are coming out of Curtis's mouth are really good. <laughs> uh, but in reality, though, I mean, like how, uh, how important it is and something he's really focusing on sharing with us from his heart is the idea of being able to have your testimony, which is exactly what Peter's talking about here, is being able to have uh, your testimony, be able to give an account for it. Uh, that, that's not the idea of somebody says, well, like, man, you're like, I mean, what, why, why are you doing what you're doing? I don't understand. Why would you give, why would you do this? And you're like, well, you see, uh, 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 but, uh, well, uh, 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 right. uh, people don't want they to They talk hear. about it at church. And they're going to have to be strong with it, but somebody that does not believe and you're stumbling over it. Right. Yeah. Like, well, and people yeah. don't want to hear that if you're honest. People don't want to hear the gospel if they don't want to hear the gospel. Right. Yeah. They don't want to hear the truth of the gospel and that it is true and all this and how it makes them, puts them in darkness, right? How the light shines on them and shows their evil ways. Amen. So the Lord says to me, the testimony is something that's personal to us that we're sharing with someone. We're giving them a piece of us. Amen. That is what connects with people. Amen. When you say, Danny... I gotta share it with you. I gotta share something with you. Satan had me bound by the chains of addiction. I nearly lost my wife. I lost two jobs. I nearly lost my family. He nearly took everything from me. My own mind. I don't even trust the only way I thought. And when I spoke and I asked Jesus to come back into my life and I made him Lord and Savior, he broke the chains from me, brother. Amen. He set me free. That is what touches people. 
That is the testimony. That is what's going to, the gospel, that's, that's why we're here right now. Because all of us have a heart and we want to draw close to the Lord. That's what the Lord would say to us. Amen. It's not spitting what, what the scripture says out because they don't want to hear it. But if they know how much, how you hurt and how the Lord saved you, they're willing to listen to you. Amen. You've got to give a piece of yourself to people and you can't be afraid to do that because you've got to know who you are in Christ. That's right. Amen. Even, that's, even, how, that's what I feel he's putting on my heart. I mean, amen. Even if you're suffering, even if it's hard, even if it's difficult. Right. Amen. It's good. Well, I think we're going to wrap up there. Next week we'll pick up, uh, kind of walk through verses 16 and 17 and kind of go on from there. Uh, but definitely uh, just some great thoughts that were shared today. Um, I just want to really encourage all of us just to really just, just to chew on. Um, every week, guys, as we walk through verses, there's always some great points of application and some great things that we see uh, from the letter. But especially um, just as we kind of walk through these verses today and what it looks like to, to be able to give an account to the, the call that's in our lives to be able to live a life of righteousness. Um, the idea of still suffering that's present in here and what it looks like to put other people before us so that we can be mindful of the gospel. Um, that's the whole reason uh, that we're doing, we're walking this life. Um, so, anyway, just some really good stuff. Uh, I'm going to close this in prayer, and uh, we'll go from there. So, Father, we just thank you for today. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for the heart of the Apostle Peter. We thank you for the things that he's shared with us today as we look at the lives that we live and the call that's there for this life of righteousness even if it means suffering and that in the midst of a life of righteousness that we should all be ready to give an account for the hope that's within us to be able to make a defense why we do what we do Father pray that we would live lives that people would ask us why are you doing what you're doing and I pray that we be mindful of you and the gospel and from a heart be able to share why we do what we do because of what you mean to us and the relationship that we have with you. I pray, God, that you would can just continue to mold us and transform us into the people that you called us to be. God, that we could live lives that are on fire for you. God, lives that, that cause people to ask questions. Father, we pray for and we thank you for salvation that will come as we live out the life you've called us to live. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>